Our moderator tonight is Scott Kirshner. I assume if you're in this room, you probably already know him. If you don't, you should. Um, I can hear him make an audible groan when I say he's probably the most influential innova innovation reporter, um, blogger, author, event planner, party attender, <laughs> presenter at the Innovation Lab. And actually, I was going to point that out. Scott was here in September. Um, giving startups some advice on how best to work with the media. That video is still on the iLab website, and if you haven't seen it, you should. Um, it is basically a Monarch Notes version of how to get in touch and communicate effectively with people like Scott. Um, I won't keep lathering on the praise or he'll kill me, but I will say, you know, his Sunday Innovation Economy columns are must-reads. He's been doing the, enter the Entrepreneur's Grill that's hosted on Hive, which are uh, great opportunities to people to pitch their business plan and then um, have it reviewed right there on the spot by somebody who um, has the capability to evaluate investment opportunities. And he is himself a startup executive. So you can chat a little bit more about your startup, I think, as part of your interview. Um, to my left is Christina Lampeonarud, Dr. Christina Lampeonarud. She is one of the world's foremost authorities on battery technology. She did her post-PhD post doc work at MIT, um, was one of the youngest, if not the youngest person to run a division of ADL and be a partner, and ran its uh, battery labs, where she, for several years, gave uh, technology and business counseling strategy to the world's top battery and uh, chem chemical companies essentially, which was great training because from that she started her own, her own startup called Boston Power, which was focused on lithium ion battery technology, uh, originally out of the garage at her home in Framingham, Mass, and then eventually moving into office spaces and over the next five or six years raising about north of $300 million in venture funding, uh, bringing in a r roughly 500 employees, bringing the first products to market, and setting up state-of-the-art manufacturing in 500,000 square feet of space. Uh, her first customer was HP, which has the garage similarity because it too started in a garage. And then the company later shifted its focus to transportation. Christina concluded her role there um, about a year ago and she now serves as a senior executive with Bridgewater Associates, one of the largest and most successful hedge fund companies in the world. And Paris Wallace is to Scott's left. Paris is president and CEO of Ovuline, a health IT company focused on helping couples conceive. Um, and he raised, I think, some new money about a month ago, which got some announcement. And he also announced a new product last week, I think. So, that, so he looks pretty good for a guy who's been that busy, I think, huh? Um, before that, he had other companies in the, in the market. And he is the co-president of the Harvard Business School uh, Angel Fund of Boston and New England. Um, he, he lectures on entrepreneurism um, on college campuses. He himself is a graduate of Techstars um, and knows very much what it's like to build startup companies. Um, so with that, I will get out of the way and turn it over to you, Scott. Thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so that was much better. The intros are much better than the ones I prepared, which uh, <laughs> were like barely even two lines. But um, <laughs> So what we wanted to do is really quickly, we're gonna, this is gonna be the shortest panel discussion of all time, uh, because, or not really panel, fireside chat of all time, because I'd love to get to the pitches. And what we decided we do is, we're gonna have Paris and Christina talk a little bit about their experiences as, as entrepreneurs, and then after each pitch, we're gonna give one of them kind of the, the question. You know, They're gonna sort of think of the toughest question that they would ask as maybe an investor or as an entrepreneur who'd be, giving advice to this team or kind of helping prepare the team for the real world. Um, so that's how it'll work. The first question I wanted to ask to each of you is just, um, at what point in your life did you feel like you could be an entrepreneur, that you could do a startup company? Like, was it a specific moment? Christine, I first met you, you were working in the labs of Tyax out at Alewife. You were toiling away in the battery lab of this consulting kind of R&D company. You hadn't yet been an entrepreneur, I think. So like, why don't you start? What was the moment for you that made you say, I believe I can take the leap? So I believe I knew as a six-year-old that I wanted to start a company with a heart. And I come from a family with a lot of philosophy and a lot of attention to what's going on in the world. And it was very important in my upbringing to be 
a positive force for others. So that was my dream. And with that, I chaired a lot of plays and initiatives and music and dance and learned a lot about leadership, actually, that way to have the ability to pull 200 people together on stage and perform a show for a few thousand people in the moment where it doesn't matter what your CV is, but it's all in the flow, has been a wonderful trait as I have continued to discover curiosity and basically explore new areas. And I... And you started doing that when you were six. You were directing plays yes. and choral <laughs> groups, and <laughs> that's when it began. Yeah, and then I borrowed my father's typewriter and wrote a play in second grade, and you know, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. How about for you, Paris? That's great. Well, oh, can everyone hear me? First, I'd like to say how awesome it is to be here in the iLab. Um, Ovuline was actually started about 20 feet that way, and my previous company was started about 100 yards that way on campus, so it's all, I always love being here. Um, and that's actually kind of a tie-in. I, I think I wasn't quite six, maybe six and a half, no. Uh, I, I worked uh, about 30 hours a week in high school at a bike shop, and I got an idea that I could probably sell the same stuff online. This was like, you know, late, the late 90s, uh, and put up this, this website um, and went to school, uh, worked with a few friends, went to school, and came back, and we had done $1,000 worth of sales. And that was about a month worth of 30 hours a week at this bike shop making minimum wage. And I was like, I am never working for anyone else again. Um, and from then on, have, have basically started companies and have pretty much avoided uh, ever having a real job. Cool. Um, I guess going back to, um, you know, Boston Power was like a big vision company, right? That you guys were going to create a different kind of lithium ion battery and go into this market against lots of uh, big competitors. When did you know, and as Chris mentioned, like the company raised a crazy amount of funding, I think 350-ish million dollars. So like when did you know in the early days of Boston Power, after you had quit your full-time job and you know, started raising some money, like, when did you know that things were clicking? Like what was the first sign for you of like this is gonna go okay? So the proof in the pudding is with a customer. So we remained in stealth for about four months and then since many of us belong to an industry segment and already had a lot of relationships, it was widely known that I had uh, basically resigned, which was a big deal in this particular industry. We worked behind the scenes from Arthur Diddle Little Technology Innovation, basically. And HP called me one day and said, hey, we've heard you resigned. We think you've started a company. Panasonic thinks that's just smoke. We think you should move to Tokyo. What are you doing? Kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, you know, we have some cool ideas. We think that batteries could last really long. They could be environmentally friendly. And hey, maybe we could make a battery that lasts the life of a notebook. And maybe, by the way, we could embrace the mobile theme of current realities, and you could charge it in 20, 30 minutes. And they're like, hmm, when it come down tomorrow? I was like, ah, how about Wednesday? So this was <laughs> so Wednesday I show up, and this is typical. It's good to have this, this kind of crowd to hang out a little bit before, because customer pitches are like this. You come in, it's 20 people in the room, and they all sit like this. And you're like, oh, I'm so excited, I have data, I want to show you all this stuff. And it's a two hour, basically, seminar. And HP style, HP headquarters was very intellectual, so no questions during the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I am kind of like, hey, what do you think? What? That's pretty cool, huh? I have prototypes, I have pilot production, this is kind of interesting, right? And the HP crowd is like, looking at their top executive, and finally, the top executive stands up and he says, well, Christina, if you could do this in mass production, we're in. <laughs> so then we knew when they were in and they delivered on that promise. Three and a half years later, we shipped our first order. That's a cool story. So they literally, they called you preemptively and said, we think you're up to something. Yes. Would you come out yes. and, and meet with yes. us? Cool. So that was cool. Yeah. Same question for you. Um, let, let's talk about Good Start Genetics as opposed to Ovuline, because Good Start, you know, has I think started in 2007, yep. prenatal genetic testing right. um, uh, for future moms, right? Uh, when did you kind of know that idea was was clicking with the market? Yeah. So I. I don't think there was one exact moment, and this is what I always kind of tell folks in in your guys' shoes. It's a, uh, it's it's this slow but sure gathering of 
market interest and smart people thinking that you're actually onto something. So the first experience is actually again right right over in in Baker in a, or in a Spangler over there in an event just like this. It was the HBS business plan competition, and we pitched and we did reasonably well. And one of the folks who was a final judge was a director at Genzyme, and he said, "Hey, you know this is pretty interesting. Can I?" help out. We were like, great. And then when we pitched the next person, we said, you know, same pitch. And we have this guy who's a director of Genzyme. Um, and then we got connected with the Mark Beer, who's the former CEO of, of Viacord and grew that business, um, really well known here in the biotech community. And then it was the same pitch, plus Viacord, plus Bob Carpenter. Um, then we got uh, chosen for the Massachusetts Life Science Center Accelerator Grant. So that, you know, and slowly but surely we added all these things up until, you know, we had enough to talk about so that people would listen. You know, and the people that we called with just the initial pitch and the first, you know, wouldn't take our phone calls. But then when we slowly had enough of these small accolades that were really um, incremental behind us, you know, the people that we really wanted to talk to would actually pick up the phone um, and listen to us. So I think it was a subtle realization as we got more and more validation from people around the road. So the one question I've always wanted to ask you, so Good Start, you know, has raised 60 million or so over the course of its life and it's still going strong under a, another CEO. Um, and then with your next company, you went through the Techstars Accelerator. And it was always kind of mystifying, because if you've been so successful raising funding already, why do you go to Techstars to take their $20,000 or whatever it is for 18%, 15%? What's the deal with Techstars? I think it's like 6%. 6%. Yeah. Um, at, at a high level, I was an industry switcher, uh -huh. right? So the biotech and tech are slowly but surely um, very resistantly getting closer and closer, but they're different skill sets, completely different investors, mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to make the transition in the quickest way possible. So in three months at Techstars, I met just about every uh, influential tech investor and CEO in Boston, uh -huh. um, and that really propelled me as someone who not only knew biotech but also allegedly knew tech, um, and that that made me you know fundable. Um, and those connections have been invaluable for growing Obuline. Um, but I think it's I think it's difficult to switch into radically different industries um, without you know a real support network, and Techstars provided that. Uh huh. Cool. Uh, so you do it again? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I mean that the whole thing about you know er everyone. It's funny, like the, all the stories you hear is about how much you need to hold on to every share of stock in the beginning. The most successful people make the decisions early on to get the right people involved to accelerate the company. Um, you know, and basically you have either your time or your stock or investors' money to accelerate, and your time is the worst thing to be spending on it because that's the resource you actually have control over. All right. So the last question I want to ask is just, you know, you guys both uh, obviously come off as superstar entrepreneurs. Um, what was the one thing, like, when you were starting Boston Power um, and building the company, like, what was the one thing that was hardest for you just on a personal level, like a skill that you really felt the weakest on or just something you just didn't know how to do? Um, give us an example. Yeah, so there are many skills. So. You have to learn a lot about uh, logistics of running a little business with no infrastructure. That's totally teachable. I think for me, Scott, the most difficult was to talk VC. So I had a previous life where I was a little bit of the expert. If I had to take 10 minutes to explain something, people were willing to give me that. If it wasn't clear, the covenant was they would ask questions and I would have a chance to clarify. Uh, my experience in the VC industry was you have two minutes. If you don't get through in two minutes, um, you're probably leaving in 10. If you m nail the two, you probably have an addition of 10, maybe then 30, and then it goes to one hour, and then you're in front of the partners. So you have to learn how to do that. And it's a very specific formula that works, and it's not teachable, I learned also, over the years. It varies over the years. What is trendy and what is the commonly held view of what is important may not be true, 
but there's a lot of folklore in that. So you've got to know what you're up against. You have to be preemptive on things that matter to your business and be declarative on things that you really know and be ready to basically engage in logic deduction on what happens, and it's fast. And there's that funny balancing act in the pitch meeting, which I've, I've sort of witnessed firsthand, which is the VCs want to ask questions probably before the second minute, right? Yes. Like they're, you know, they see your first slide and they're like, let me ask you this. Um, but that you can't cede control to them. You, know, you can't let them dominate the discussion because then it's like, oh, you're a passive CEO. Like, why are you letting us push you around? So it's this funny. Yeah, you should you know, bring a little humor to every pitch. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how about for you, Paris? Just kind of something that was an area that you really had to learn or work on. Yeah, I think, I think it was really overcoming this idea that, and I'll be extreme about it, that the idea mattered. Right, that you have a good idea, you talk to enough people, and eventually, you know, someone sees your idea just like you see it, and you know, it's it's all uh, uh, fairy tales and rainbows. I mean, really, it's about getting the team, and it's about getting the people stuff right. Um, you know, and you now seeing seeing deals through uh, the HBS Angels and being involved in tech stars, a lot of people have the same idea at the same time. A lot of companies get started to do the same thing at the same time. And it's not the fidelity or, or you know, how amazing your idea is. It's about how you collect the resources, the human resources around you to execute on that idea faster, bigger, better than everyone else. Uh, you know, so you know, we spent a year at Good Start walking around, pitching the idea slowly but surely, trying to get people um, uh, involved who could help us accelerate. Um, and with Avilon at the first, uh, in the beginning, you know, we uh, it took a very different approach, which was go out and find the absolute best people and do whatever it takes to get them involved. And that's allowed us to ramp up so much quicker. And it's a huge lesson that, that I had to toil through at Good Start. So um, would you like to ask a couple questions before we move on to the pitches? Uh, Pop up your hand if you have a question for either Paris or Christina, or we can uh, dispense with Q&A and just go right to the pitches. Um, but I don't want to leave you out. Yeah, we'll take a couple questions, so go ahead. I just had a question for Paris. Um, when you had sort of made those distinctions as to who were the people you wanted to bring on board, did you just made that, made that discernment as to, well, you have X percentage of them that are involved in X-Star, so here's where I'll go, and when they're eating pizza, I'll walk up next to them, or what do you know? Was it really just like, the percentage-wise, this is probably my best bet, or what sort of drew you in that direction and made you stick with things and those that you It's a great question. I mean, I think that it starts out with kind of a philosophy of what type of company you want to build and what type of people you want to attract. So uh, my, my current company, Ovulon, it's a mobile consumer health company. Uh, I'm the only person with a healthcare background. Uh, no one had ever built a mobile app before. Um, and no one had ever really done a direct-to-consumer thing before. But, you know, I'd be in a room like this, you know, and there would be one person who would come up to me afterwards and say, I absolutely love what you're doing. And I would say, great, why don't you come, uh, you know, why don't you come and, and work with me for a few months uh, and volunteer? Uh, and if that works out, we'll see what we can do. And then those people would come and volunteer. And these are smarter people than me and more successful, but they really had the passion for what we were doing. We'd, I'd give them ridiculously ambitious goals for that month that they were working with me that it was impossible that they could possibly finish. Saw how they dealt with those goals, and most of the times they exceeded those expectations. And then I'd say, you're hired, <laughs> right, basically. Um, so, but, but, you know, and that's very different than at Good Start where we needed a molecular biologist with a sequencing-based background. There were five people, and then we just went and groveled uh, until the person said yes, basically. But I do think it, it starts out with going out, talking to a lot of people, being really clear about the type of company you're trying to build, the type of person you're trying to recruit, um, and then selling your idea and pitching this big picture and seeing who, who comes to you because it's impossible to force it. But you didn't get any like mobile developers or programmers to work for you for a month on spec, did you? I mean, maybe you're more persuasive than I think, but uh, so, like that's the, those are the hardest people to... It's funny, so um, someone who went to my school five years after the man, I started a, a storage company when I was in college. So I sold it, and then this, this guy bought it uh, four years later, and he graduated, and he called me um, while I was at Good Start and said, you know, any, any business advice? Uh, and I said, great, you know, and, and I'm talking to him, and I said, do you think you could teach yourself how to code? 
He goes, I don't know, maybe. I said, come, come work with me. So I've now been working with him. All, yeah, and he, and he, he gave us time. He learned, mm -hmm. right? But ultimately, he was a smart person. Um, and, you know, so he wasn't necessarily a mobile developer beforehand, but okay. now he's, he's our head of engineering and doing a great job. So. All right. And was this a data storage company or like a store your stuff over the summer company? Store your stuff over the summer company. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's important to ask. Uh, any other questions for, oh, there's one all the way over there. Yeah. Speak loudly and we'll try to maybe repeat it. Oh, there's a microphone. I'm just curious, uh, either one of you, um, when did you know that it was time for another CEO and how did you manage that transition? So in my case, um, we got a wake-up call with the U.S. recession. So we were scaling during the years of 2008, 2009. So we had basically gone from portable electronics, very high-end, HP, Asus Tech, Lenovo as brands, some medical devices, wearable electronics in the United States. We had started courting the transportation business in basically three regions, Asia, predominantly China, Taiwan, Europe predominantly Germany, Italy, and then the United States. And um, the US customer base basically slowed down, the European customer base started slowing down, and it was very obvious that the Asian markets took off. So with that, our customers just took off, and we decided we had to move a big technology center from Boston to Beijing. We had to scale our factories. We decided outside Shanghai, and most of our supply chain was already in China. So. I knew that I love traveling to China and Taiwan and Japan and Germany and all this stuff, but I want to live here. So that made that uh, pretty obvious. Do you want to take a crack at the same question? Uh, sure. So in, in Good Start, it was planned obsolescence. I mean, with uh, the, my co-founder and I had no technology background. The last biology class we had taken was sophomore year in high school. Uh, you know, we were going into an industry where the uh, next youngest CEO was 20 years older than us. And so we, we pitched and said, look, we, we need money, we're going to push the ball, but ultimately we're going to hire someone who has a tremendous amount of experience, and that was a selling point in raising money. We ended up hiring the CEO of LabCorp, the second largest laboratory company um, in, the, in the country. Uh, and he was excited. To, he was excited to do it. and We were excited to kind of hand it over because that was a requirement to building the company. Of all the hats you've had to wear, which was the, which was the hardest, like highest degree of difficulty? Yeah. So for me, it was probably the transition from a U.S. headquarter company to a Beijing headquarter company. I stayed on as chairman to ensure that the transition went well with customers and with, uh, of course, the team to move basically most of the intelligence off US to China was hard to try to, so we built a company based on values. So super high quality, unbelievable high ethics, sustainability, all those things, to try to ensure that that was gonna continue. And yet recognizing fully the reason we had succeeded in the United States was very much that we had a value proposition that was aligned with these cultures and somewhat admired and times also celebrated those values. And the China we were moving into were partly embracing them but partly rushing to other values. So that was actually really hard. And to step back and say, I am now giving you the car keys you drive. But so far, so good. Boston Power is executing in 12 cities in, in China, actually, on electric cars. So our commitment to be a good force in the world has happened. And the collaboration has continued with academia and basically the younger generation. So part of the mission got at least accomplished. Yeah, I would say it's, it's just people, right? I mean, I, I always joke that the business part is easy. It's convincing everyone else <laughs> that you know to, to do what you need them to do to fi to figure them out whether they be a customer, an employee, or an investor. Um, really having empathy for and figuring out how to motivate them in the appropriate way um, and move forward. Uh, and you, you see a lot of the first time entrepreneurs, they go in and they're trying to execute on their plan and they don't realize that as CEO, your main job is to get other people to execute on the plan that you lay out. Um, and it's, you know, it's a full time job just to do that. Please help me thank these two speakers and you'll hear a little bit more from them after the pitches.
My name is Colin Hong. I'm a co-founder of Revivo Energy Choose. And if I could just get a quick show of hands, how many people here had a hard day at work today? Or school? And how many of you still have work to do after this? And so if you're anything like me, you're going to go over to the local CVS and get an energy boost. And when you're there, look at the shelf and look at the options. You've got Red Bull, Rockstar, Five Hour. The common theme here is that they're all terrible for you. High sugar, high calorie, laundry list of chemicals back there. You're making a pact with the devil by drinking those things. But what other choice do you have? If not for that, you're looking at Kind Bars and Trail Mix. Is Trail Mix going to get you through your project tonight? Maybe if you add caffeine to it, there's a startup. Somebody write it down. But for the rest of us, we're stuck in no man's land. We're trying to get the energy that we need without sacrificing our health. And that's why we developed Revivo Energy Chews. Revivo Energy Chews combine the effectiveness of caffeine with the power of vitamins and minerals to give you the, health, the energy you need now and the health you'll want later. No preservatives, no GMOs, we're over 99% natural. Each chew contains 20 milligrams of caffeine. This allows you to customize your intake. If you only need a quick boost, have one or two. If you need more, have more. And in the meantime, you can put them back in your pocket to save them for later. So you try that with a half-open Red Bull. And as often as it is, when you're making a healthy and effective product, taste falls by the wayside. But not us, we said. We wanted to make one of the best tasting caffeine products on the market. And I think we succeeded, and you can try out afterwards. We developed Revivo Energy Chews into what we wanted. And as it turns out, a lot of other people wanted that too. In June, we soft launched into mom and pop stores around Boston in order to test out our pricing our marketing strategy, our product placement, and our packaging. What we found, $3 was the right price point. That our best marketing strategy was sampling, actually giving it to somebody and having them taste the benefit. We found that for product placement, it was front shelf or die. And we found that our packaging kind of looks like cigarettes. But we took that data that we learned, and we officially launched in September into the MIT grocery store where with only a small marketing push targeted towards freshmen, we moved about 100 boxes per week. That's more than most other energy products in the grocery store. Now we're expanding to Northeastern, NBU, and we're using our prior successes as case studies in order to ensure that we get the margins that we want and the product placement that we need. The next step for us is the greater Boston area, where we'll implement the same tried and true strategy that we started right here in Cambridge. It'd be easy to pass out a bunch of product in order to ask for your vote, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but more important to us than your votes is your mindset. The next time that you go into a CVS, look at the options and remember that there are healthier options available, even if Revivo is not quite in CVS yet. And if you can't wait to go to the CVS, Stick around, we'll have a box out there. Thank you very much, everybody. So um, the way we're gonna do this to keep it moving is just one question from one of us uh, after each pitch, so. Um, I guess my question is maybe from a media perspective is, um, you know, there was this startup or there is a startup in Cambridge called AeroShot that was doing inhalable, yeah. uh, you know, sort of this caffeine powder with some vitamins and stuff. And they kind of ran into, you know, both questions from the FDA because of the way they were delivering it. And then also just the sort of public perception of like energy stuff and caffeine stuff being used by people who are maybe under 18 and using too much of it. So like, what have you thought about the, just the, the sort of marketing branding spin of like, you know, we want people to use this responsibly, right, basically. Right. So, so our first step for that is our marketing strategy, which is completely aimed towards adults. And you see that through our strategy of going through college campuses. A uh, couple of differences of us and AeroShots. Uh, we don't expect a post-market FDA investigation because we're not putting particles of stuff into your lungs like they were. Um, also, one of the reactions to AeroShots is it's an incredibly like, unintuitive way of getting energy. You're inhaling something almost like you have asthma. Uh, and then finally, the taste of AeroShots was actually what drove most of us away. We actually bought it and tried it. Uh, and I don't know if you have. Yeah, it, nothing I, is worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like over the sink for a couple minutes with water like that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, well, let's give Colin a big round of applause. All right, everybody, I'll get started. I'm Andrew Cole, co-founder of Cardis. We're an NGO working here at the IAB, and I'll be talking to you tonight about how we're putting your NGO impact on the map. So on November 6th, a couple weeks ago, Typhoon Yolanda struck in the Philippines. A lot of devastation occurred, but people around the world really rallied. Volunteers from all over came to places like Cebu and Tegloban in the central Philippines, donated their time, their energy, their resources. This is a really great thing. But it's hard for those people to find the right way to allocate their time and energy. Right now, there's no way to have a bird's eye view of what's going on in the ground in the nonprofit industry. That's a huge problem. People don't know where their work can be of best effect. So right now, this is me. I'm that little dot on the screen right there. I'm working, let's say, on a rural school project in Africa. I know, what I, I know what's going on in my organization. I know what's going on right now. But it's really hard for me to talk to other people in the field. People around the world are going to be working on projects similar to mine that are going to be able to teach me lots of different things. But I won't be able to communicate with those people. That's where Cardis comes in. Cardis is turning on the light with a crowdsourced map of nonprofit activity. What we're doing is giving individuals the ability to create profiles for the work that they do. They can upload their experiences to the Cardis platform, aggregate these experiences to organizational profiles. And what we start to get is a picture of what people are doing in real time. So compared to our competitors who send teams out into the field just for surveys once a year, this is a really dynamic, changing picture of what's going on. This is really great. So in a place like the Philippines, what you start to see is a really, what's going on in real time on the ground. So you can find out where best to, best to go, where you can really have an impact. So we have three groups of people here. We have the individuals who are uploading the information to the map. For them, we want this to be a free service. That's going to help them do the best that they can on the ground, find their impacts, be able to communicate with people, populate this map. We also have nonprofits and foundations. And we're going to charge. Nonprofits and foundations, a small fee for services. That'll help, help us keep the lights on. That'll help people on the ground communicate with each other. So for nonprofits, what we offer is an institutional memory. So when people aggregate their information to these organizational profiles, what we start to develop is a chronology of events. So a lesson that I learned in 2009 working at that rural school, somebody in 2013 is going to be able to use what I learned. And that nonprofit is ultimately going to save money. They're not going to have to reteach someone how to do something that somebody already learned. That's going to save them money on the bottom line. We're going to increase their bottom line by increasing donations. What an organizational profile on Cardis is, is increased web exposure. So they're going to be able to use this site to attract people to the organization, attract donation from the internet. For foundations, the people that are planning projects and financing projects on the ground, we're going to offer a consultancy service that will allow them to find out how to best implement projects in certain areas. We'll have data on how people have combated certain problems, issues, populations in the past. They'll be able to learn from that and better implement projects, saving them money as well. Our team, we have 22 years of collective nonprofit experience, 10 years of experience in tech, one successful nonprofit startup, and two successful tech startups. And uh, you know, we've been in the field. We had this problem, and we really think we're the right audience. We're the right team to get this done. We want to be there for the next Typhoon Yolanda. And uh, we can make it happen with your help. So thanks a lot. So I, I wanted to ask you a quick question uh, around how you reach critical mass. Obviously, you know, it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg problem. Yeah. How do you get enough data in your system to make it uh, to make it into a place where more people want to put data into the system to make it robust? So we, act we asked ourselves the same question and we sort of posed it as why would people upload information to this map if there was no one else on it, if they couldn't communicate with anyone else? And we think the real value is, people we've spoken to in the field, they think the real value is in that institutional memory aspect. So it's sort of like, uh, you know, a uh, Facebook profile that everyone has a password to. Everyone has the ability who has worked in an organization to upload information to that organization. So you start to develop that history. Those lessons are preserved. People don't have to waste the same time and energy learning the same lessons over and over again when you sort of have that document of what people have done. So that is a way for us to sort of attract people to an area where there might not be any other activity. There might not be any other pins on the map. And uh, you know, if we get enough of those people 
who are only working internally like that, we think we can actually get that big map published. All right, great answer. So a uh, big round of applause for Andrew, especially if you like his haircut. <laughs>Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Megan and I represent Melange. We're not selling energy chews, but I wanted to ask all of you, how many of you drink a cup of coffee or tea in the morning? Yeah, everybody, okay. And um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the K-Cups machine, right? Okay, well the K-Cups machine gives you a full selection of the products and it's extremely convenient to use. You can have espresso, coffee, tea, cider, whatever you want, brewed for you in just minutes. Now, for women, they also have this habit that they do every morning, but they don't have the same level of convenience and choice. And that's their makeup routine. So we are trying to bring the same level of convenience to women because women go to the store, they look around at the cosmetics, they could order online, but it doesn't always match their skin. And cosmetic companies don't always make cosmetics that match women's skin, so they just have to make do. And if you've ever seen a woman with cosmetics that don't match your skin, it's a problem. All right, so the main problems of the cosmetics industry are selection. The consumers are limited by what's at the store. Price, if you go to a custom cosmetics boutique, you're going to pay a lot of money. And convenience, most working women don't have the time to go to Sephora and wait in line, only to find out that their favorite lipstick isn't being sold anymore. So our solution, the Melange solution, is to create a machine that makes your custom cosmetics instantly. What does this machine look like? This machine, if you can visualize it, is a combination of a K-Cups machine and a 3D printer. A K-Cups machine because it offers you the same daily convenience and a 3D printer because it offers the same innovative and mm, disruptive technology. Oop. Sorry, skipped ahead too fast. Okay, so how does this machine work? The machine works very similar to a K-Cups machine. The consumer, every morning, they would go and put a bottle in, or whenever they want to make the product, choose their custom formulation and print it, and it's ready for them in minutes. So I've told you the problem, I've told you our solution, and now I want to tell you where we're going with this. Right now, we are currently fundraising a million dollars. Um, we are testing our demo. And the first market that we want to enter is salons. Now this product makes sense for nail salons because they can create a custom color for every customer that walks through their door. They can be stockless and no longer have as much waste. Next, we would like to approach the consumer market. I'm not sure if you're aware, but this is a $40 billion market and 80% of the spending is done by 10% of the consumers. So if there's those 10% of the consumers are who we're trying to reach in our second stage. And finally, we'd like to uh, make a partnership with a retailer like CVS or Sephora. And this machine makes sense for them because the consumers can walk in, and even if they're not in that top 10%, the rest of the 90% of the color cosmetic market can order their custom cosmetics at the retailer. All right, thank you for listening, and please vote for Melange because we're going to make the world a more beautiful place, and we might make our competitors look a little easier on the eyes. <laughs>
two tests and three papers and my coach is breathing down my neck and it's just a little too much to handle. Uh, the fact of the matter is studies have shown that 80% of college students feel seriously overwhelmed by all they have to do. And many resort to using drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism. I don't know. I'm not going to make any judgments here. Um, but the fact of the matter is there are really deleterious effects, uh, assault, uh, unsafe sex, uh, addiction, just to name a few. Some startling numbers are that one in four students will contract an STD, one in four. 30% felt too depressed to function. One in 10 seriously considered suicide. And every year, over 1,000 uh, succeed, in a sense. So this is, this is a pretty tragic thing when you consider the investment someone is making in their college career. Now, in addition to these costs are some serious financial costs. Over $10 billion spent every year to treat STDs, mental health, and alcohol-related hospitalizations. Yet, despite these costs, Schools' responses have lagged, um, often low and ineffective technology like pamphlets and posters. When we know more than ever today that students are using their phones to access resources, you know, menus at the dining hall, Facebook, Twitter, coursework, so we've created SQ, which is a platform that meets students where they are and when they need it most. We bring together the campus resources as well as risk analyzers and fun and engaging content, which students can relate to. We deploy the app using a, a model of collaborating closely with the school and the student groups, as well as a student outreach program, a peer-based student outreach program. And for students, the content is something that they can take peace in, and their parents get peace of mind, too. When you consider the tuition investment that's made, a few dollars, we're talking about $5 per student per year, across 20 million students per year for a total addressable market of $100 million, it's not much. So we develop the content. Our team has broad experience in technology development, in healthcare policy, that's me, and management, that's sort of all three of us. And we work very closely with the schools to make our product uh, realized. Now we're looking for a quarter of a million dollars to help us hit our milestone of one year having 10 school sales. Already we have a contract, knock on wood, that's coming out in which we're going to be able to roll out our beta app to over 20,000 students, which we're very excited about. We've also established, established a, an advisory board with uh, expertise across clinical, business, and technical challenges. Um, we have a great team. We're very excited about the work that we're doing. And we look forward to talking to more of you about how we can make SQ help us realize individual and public health across schools. Thank you very much. So I thought Paris would have a question with his deep healthcare <laughs> background. But um, so you guys pivoted a little bit from the description that I had read. Um, sure. Just tell us a little bit about the earlier concept and kind of what made you pivot. Sure, sure. Uh, great question. We did a ton of market validation. We spoke with uh, both events. So the, the pivot is a pivot from an app that enables people to share STD testing results. And so we figured there are some communities that would be more interested, particularly the gay male community, because they're most familiar with public health issues, specifically around sexual health. So we did a lot of validation of that. We talked to end users. We also talked to some of the, the folks who are running uh, Manhunt and other gay online dating websites. And they said there are a lot of issues still related to stigma. And, and that honestly, there is a lot of risk related to having two people tell each other that they're both clean. Because then there's a moral hazard where you don't have people feeling they need to use a barrier protection. Mm -hmm. So we, this, this model, the SQ model, we're calling version one, was a way to get to broader adoption. And we found a lot of support from school administrators that we've talked to at conferences in which they felt that they were not substantially addressing sexual health, mental health, and substance abuse. And a lot of them still are using pamphlets or handouts or you know, some page on the website that no one's yeah. ever visited. Yeah. yeah, and they're publicly displayed. You know, Who wants to like, look at a herpes pamphlet when they know someone's walking behind them? Uh, whereas, the, the app, <laughs> right? whereas the app helps students maintain a sense of privacy. Cool. Great job. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone. Picture a house with a single light switch. You come in, you turn the lights off, and the whole house goes dark. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, that's how all of your heating and cooling systems work. It's either all on or all off. This is not only extremely wasteful because you're heating and cooling empty space, but it's extremely uncomfortable. You get hot spots, you get cold spots, and literally nothing works the way it should. Hi everyone, I'm Dip, I'm from EcoVent, and uh, I want to tell you a story about when I was saving for my wedding. And I decided, as a genius I am, to go shut off vents in my house. Worked great, saved a lot of money, it was awesome, then my mom came to visit and I forgot to open the vents, and I tortured her all night. Being an engineer working on some most ridiculous uh, missile defense technology, I knew there was a better way. So five years ago, I started recruiting engineers at Lockheed and decided to come to MIT because I needed to meet people that shared the same ridiculous passion I did to get this thing off the ground. So our homes suck. They're not comfortable. <laughs> Nothing works. You're spending a lot of money, and the worst part is Everybody knows about this. You guys have all felt this. The problem is nobody knows how to fix it. I wear a Snuggie. Some of you get space heaters. Some of you get air conditioning. That's fine. The bottom line is this is unacceptable for something that is probably your most expensive asset if you're lucky enough to own one. So how does EcoVent solve this multitude of ridiculous problems? Well, first I want to tell you about what homeowners currently do. What do they do? They call their HVAC guy. They don't know their name. Some dude, he's like, hey, I'll be there next week, whatever. You call them, they come over, and you say, I need you to make my house comfortable. This guy says, you have a $20,000 solution. I can come in, cut your ducks out, and give you all the zones you need. Don't worry, everything will work great. You spend a lot of money, you do it, it doesn't work. You're pissed, you get your space heater, your Snuggies anyway. And you feel okay, because the Snuggies and space heaters are cheap. So, EcoVent, how does this work? It's an entirely wireless solution that anybody can install. This includes me, it includes my mom, it includes my grandmom. It's fantastic. You walk into a house, Pull out the vents like you see here, plug in our wireless vents. You plug in some sensors across the room, and then you um, essentially plug in a controller. And it looks just like a black box, you just plug it in. The whole system's up and running. If you have a compatible wireless thermostat, you're done. If not, we'll give you one, you plug that in, and that's it. You never again have to worry about hot and cold spots in your house. Best news is, we have a system that will be up and running in two months. If any of you are sadistic, we can come meet me afterwards and we could play around with our lead engineer's house for fun. Make him cold, why not? He's in Texas, it's okay. And um, essentially, we've got the best team. We've talked to a lot of people that have this problem, not only installers who want a better solution, but also companies like Next Step Living, which is this amazing energy efficiency retailer. These guys are in 6,000 homes a month and they are dying for our system because they want to offer it for sale. Not only that, We've got a strong IP portfolio of about 18 patents. We filed a provisional and the, the patents are coming up. We've got a ridiculously good team. I, can't, I don't even have enough time to tell you how good they are. Come see me afterwards and, I, and I'll get them for you. So we're EcoVent. Please give me your fake money because it makes me look good, even if, though it's fake. But really, if any of you have this problem, we're looking for beta customers. We've got a dozen signed up. We're looking for more. All of you want, want it. We'll give it to you at a good deal. Please join us. Thank you. Let's make this home comfortable and save a ton of money. Thank you. Oh, questions. Go ahead. That's great. So saving some energy in the homes and making that more efficient. Yes. Uh, can you give us some numbers on what a regular home actually would save, both in kilowatts as well as in basically running costs, what your experience is? And if you also would be so kind to vary that a little bit across the day. So when you go into peak, and can you have an eff effect on that? Have you All right, let's, that? let's do a simple use case, me and my wife, okay? It's two of us, we're in a big home. Big home, okay, we're in a bigger home. Let's just say a small home. But uh, okay, you walk home, and my wife is cold, so she hits the thermostat up six degrees, right? Which you never should do, by the way. Just hit it one degree and see if you like it before you do it again. So the system goes into full speed. She ends up super hot. I'm, I'm annoyed because I'm sweating no matter what's going on. So I go and hit the temperature down. Hopefully she doesn't see, and then she's cold, and the cycle repeats, right? So what to do? People overcompensate. It happens everywhere. When I don't eat one revival, I eat 17, because I'm psychotic a little bit. But the bottom line is, we're wasting a ton of energy. So what does EcoVent do? It tracks you throughout your home. It learns that Dip likes to come home, and I speak in the third person, too, as well. I, I sit in the kitchen, you know, and then maybe I'll go watch the Eagles get their butts kicked by the Pats or something. But the fact is, EcoVent will learn and will send the air exactly where I'm at. And not only that, but it knows my preferences. It'll know your preferences. It'll know my mom's preferences, for sure. 
But the fact of the matter is, you're only heating and cooling the space you need, you know? And we'll save you up as much as any programmable thermostat, probably double. Our system pays itself off in less than three years. And best of all, it's one-fifth the cost of any competition. Thank you. All right, so I'm Laura, and I'm one of the co-founders at Six Foods, because six legs are better than four, and we make healthy, sustainable, and delicious foods from insects. So why do we do this? Well, the meat industry has a lot of problems. So the livestock industry currently produces 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and we use almost half the water in our country to raise livestock for food. And this is only going to get worse. By 2050, the global demand for meat is expected to double, a demand that we cannot currently meet. <laughs> <laughs> but what if we raised insects instead of cattle? We could reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by up to 10%. Insects use 1,000 times less water and can produce up to 12 times as much meat for the same amount of feed as cows. And hence, our solution is obvious. Kickstart an insect eating movement and provide people with an alternative source of protein that is healthy and delicious. So we work with a chef at Sofer Bakery, Jeff Lucas, to come up with a line of high protein packaged snacks that look and taste good. So all of these foods you see here are actually made out of insects. But how do we actually get to that finished product? So our story starts with insect farms. We source insects from insect farms then work with our chef to come up with recipes. And ultimately, we want to distribute our products through online and also specialty food stores. So through specialty food stores, we can target the people who we know will love our products. Paleo dieters, yogis, runners, and people who really care about the environment. So that's where we come in. So we're a team of three women. And collectively, we have six legs. Clearly the ideal team. <laughs> so I'm the environmental visionary. Rose over here is in charge of all of our marketing and business. She's worked at Abercrombie and Microsoft and really knows how to create a, bra create a brand and create a buzz. <laughs> and <laughs> anyway, so our addressable market, thank you, Rose, <laughs> is the $30 billion private label snack food industry. So three years after our product launch, we are projected to hit a 60% gross profit margin and maintain business through our cash flow. We want to follow Cliff Barr's go-to-market strategy and start in specialty food stars and create a lifestyle brand within grocery. So the big question is, how are we actually going to get people to eat insects? And uh, we've got three ideas. So first of all, most of the world is actually already eating insects. 80% of countries and over 2 billion people regularly eat insects. Second of all, we've been testing our products on hundreds of people over the last five weeks, and people keep coming back for more. And third of all, we know from history that perceptions can change. So lobsters used to be fed to prisoners, and the idea of eating raw fish in sushi was considered disgusting. But now these are delicacies. So we're going to start with our line of packaged foods, and then our goal is to expand all sorts of insect meat products in grocery stores and restaurants. So in conclusion, we're six foods because six legs are better than four, and we've brought high-protein chocolate chirp cookies for you guys to all to try. <laughs> so try these and judge for yourself if you like eating insects, and if you do, vote for us. Bug appetit! <laughs> Okay, yeah. yeah, break those out. Uh, well, they clearly, Laura, they saved you for last for yeah, a reason. Um, that was great. Am I going to ask the question, Paris? You've, you've been quiet for a while. A lot of questions. You have a lot of questions. What, just ask one or two. Yeah, yeah so, certainly. So, you know, walk me through when you talk to a customer about this for the first time and you have the cookies between you and them. Yeah. What resonates with them and what hesitations do they have? Yeah. Uh, and how do you think you're going to be able to convince people of this without talking with them face to face? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, one thing is it's high protein, which is really big right now, and it's a really high quality source of protein. So that's why we're starting with people. Paleo dieters are really into it because people ate insects. We've been eating insects forever. 
There's also been a lot of studies on perception, food perception. And it turns out that if you make your product not look like insects, people are much more likely to try it. So clearly, we're, we're going to, uh, so if you've noticed, none of our products look like insects. They look really delicious. And we also know if we can get people to try it once and get it in their mouth, then they'll realize it tastes good and we'll continue to eat it, which is why we're doing food booths, really getting everyone, we want everyone in America to try insects once. And we think if we can do that, then we can get people to continue eating them. Okay, well, I want to ask another question just because you mentioned Sofer Bakery. So yeah. like the honest response to this question, you worked with this chef at Sofer to develop some recipes. Yeah? Well, it's, we're continually working. We're working okay. multiple times a week, yeah. But would, what would Sofra say, or what has Sofra said when you, when you said, well, you know, why don't we start selling some of these at Sofra and see if people will buy them? I mean, it's a possibility. Um, we haven't figured it out for sure, but we've definitely gotten interest from stores who are interested in doing it. Um, but Sofra hasn't yet. Well, so the chef, it's like a se very separate thing. So he's a chef at Sofra, but he doesn't, you know, it's not Sofra Bakery itself. So well, it's definitely a conversation we'll have to have once we actually get the product. But um, yeah. Okay, great job. <laughs>